Okay, we're going to do a speed version of AP Art History, um, looking at the development of modern art in the United States, but focusing on abstract expressionism. Um, there's so much content here, I could probably spend an entire week, but of course we don't have that much time, so I'm going to zip through, and I was going to delete a bunch of stuff, but then I thought, you know what, if something catches your eye and you're really interested, you can do some further research later on it instead. Um, you know, if I don't show you at all, you might have never seen it. So let's go ahead and get started. So, um, if you remember when we looked at modern art, we talked about how art was really central, centralized, the art world was centralized in Paris before World War II. And so this is like late, excuse me, this is like early 1900s, right before World War II. Uh, we have a group of artists that were very influential to the abstract expressionists, and they were called the German expressionists. So these are the ones who kind of saw um, what was happening in their own country, and they were really disillusioned with what was going on and showed that in their artwork. Um, so this is George, um, George Gross, right, fit to serve. That's kind of a caricature. Um, he has many paintings that kind of look at um, they're kind of cubist in nature, but he's kind of looking at the political figures of the day, showing how crazy society is coming, um, getting, how it's developing, how it's nightmarish and hell-like. Um, this is Beckman, and so he was looking at like the historical past, and he did a lot of diptychs and triptychs, looking at artists like Grunewald and Durer, a lot of the Renaissance artists coming out of, of Europe or at least out of Germany where he was from. And he would often show people kind of like puppets and how the people, the German people kind of became puppets for Nazism and did a lot of horrible things um, because they were basically corrupted by their leader. So here's a triptych um, that he made, which he was referencing Grunewald. Um, we also have a lot of sculptures that you probably have seen before that are popular during this time. Um, they were often part of the abstract creation group where they were not really doing realistic sculptures and they were very much influenced by cubism. So you're going to see a lot of biomorphic designs. This is Barbara Hepworth. Um, she was married to Ben Nicholson, who was one of the steel artists that we saw, and she would often pair um, these kind of biomorphic forms, and she would do them by themselves or in pairs to kind of insinuate like maybe a couple, like, you know, a married couple or someone in some sort of relationship. Um, she would often, in her single images, give them kind of an opening, and then she would often have um, wire um, that could be plucked. And if you think about like some sort of guitar or, or stringed instrument, there would be that vibration. So that was supposed to represent life. Um, but some of them are very, very simple, very, very um, geometric in nature. Um, it's said that this two figures was inspired by um, the image of Menkara and his queen that we saw earlier. Um, this is Henry Moore. He was probably the most famous English sculptor, uh, maybe of all time. And he did a lot of amorphic um, creatures like Hepworth. And what he's best known for is these reclining figures. Um, he would do them in stone. He would do them in wood. Um, he was inspired by a lot of Mesoamerican artwork, like Chimol figures. Um, this is from... Um, uh, the Tialco um, group in Mexico. Right here's one in wood. Um, and then Henry Moore. Henry Moore started by making a bunch of wire sculptures, and then that led to things like mobiles. So remember that mobiles um, are kinetic sculptures. They move in the air. And so if you ever go to a museum and see one of these, don't touch it. But maybe you want to blow on it, and you'll see that it will change its shape and form um, from different angles. Um, 
He also made stabile, so sculptures in very simple biomorphic forms as well. You can really see the influence of surrealism on this, right? This is called the crab. This is the flamingo. This is in Chicago in um, Federal Plaza, right by the Mies van der Rohe um, Federal Building. It's supposedly made from the same steel that, van der, um, that Mies used for um, the building itself. And it's in colder red. A lot of colders are in this bright red color. So that leads us to our abstract expressionists. And um, the theme for modernism, if you remember, is this idea that art is about the creation um, from the artist. So it's all about the ideas of the artist and not really concerned with patronage. And so we're going to see after World War II, we're going to see the art world move to New York. A lot of artists immigrated from Europe. Um, of course, Paris was um, uh, occupied by the Nazis. And so a lot of art artists let, uh, fled. And so we're going to see New York rise. Okay. So we also have a theme, and this is a theme for modernism in America, but also probably with postmodernism as well. And this is called America, the Not So Beautiful React. So this is a reactionary sort of frenetic or chaotic time in art. Um, the R stands for revolution. It's a revolution against realism, representation, and the past. The E stands for environments. We're going to see artworks that are based on installations. So that means that a room could be an entire artwork um, that would be set up or it could be something that is based on an environmental experience. So you would go outside and someone would distort or change the environment um, in the act of making an artwork. The A stands for action painting, which we're gonna focus on today. So this idea that it's about the actions of the artist. The C stands for conceptualism. This comes from Duchamp. The idea that it's about the idea of art rather than the final product. The T stands for transitory. This is the idea that art is intended to change. And so um, also the idea that art world moves from Europe to America. Okay, so we're going to zip through um, a few more artists before we actually get to people like Jackson Pollock. And so this is Giacometti. He was a Swiss sculptor who was often inspired by the devastations of war. Thinking about how he treats the body, you can see how he sees um, how the human spirit was destroyed by that really long war um, and the devastation that it caused. The figures are very, they feel burnt like, they're very skin, they're very tied to the earth. Notice those feet, it's like they're kind of locked in place. Um, this is Francis Bacon, he's an English painter who um, created these nightmarish images based on Velasquez paintings. So there's Velasquez, right? So this is like the Pope with two sides of meat. Kind of scary, right? distorted. Um, this is Gorky. Gorky was actually a Russian artist who worked very much in biomorphic surrealism, but also you can see the influence of Kandinsky in his work. His work is very, very loose, kind of painterly, drippy, right? I always say he's kind of a cross between Moreau and Kandinsky. So the Moreau is here, right? The Kandinsky is here. And this is a Gorky. So the abstract expressionist is a US invention. Um, often it's called the New York School as well. Um, it's a combination of expressionism, so art about emotion, as well as abstraction, so abstraction being a distortion. Art is often based on surrealism. So it's not based on that super realistic surrealism. It's based on automatism. So this is this kind of automatic painting or drawing without a lot of thought or reason, and it kind of becomes what it is. Um, so that leads us to the next part. They were opposed to the use of reason in creating artwork. Most of these artists were 
um, seeing a psychiatrist. And so they were very much invested in um, the study of Jung. And a lot of psychologists were looking at the ideas of the collective unconscious. So what does that mean? Collective unconscious means that we all as humans can understand something because innately in our being, um, we've had past experiences. Our ancestors had past experiences and that we somehow learn through our like DNA and our personality, this, this kind of universal beliefs in humanity. Um, this idea that we all, um, you know, kind of have this similar moral codes and so on. It's kind of this very, very um, cerebral attempt at thinking about how we all can understand very abstract symbols, right? So this idea of symbolism. The artist also worked in improvisation. They did a lot of dripping, slashing, slinging, pouring, scraping of paint. They worked very um, spontaneously. There's a lack of control. They used big overarching themes. So like anger, chaos, sadness, joy. They wanted to create these kind of universal emotions. And that's part of that collective unconscious that by seeing their painting, you would feel something. And so the works are often large, like very, very big, like as big as a wall. And they're, they express the inner emotions of the artist with bold application of color and paint. So the artist that comes to mind for this kind of style is Jackson Pollock. We often call him Jack the Dripper. And he is um, known for his action painting or what we call gestural abstract expressionism. And so um, I see so many knockoffs of his paintings. You know, when people say, oh, I don't know how to do art, but I'm gonna paint. This is often the style they retreat to. So what is his style? I called him Jack the Dripper, right? So let's go ahead and watch a little bit of a video of him at work. He recorded this in his lifetime. The old masters had secretive image projecting oh, devices sorry. to help them draw faster and better. So hundreds of years later. Here we go. So he is actually painting on glass and the camera was underneath the glass. So I want you to pay attention to his arm as he works. The quality is not good on this, but it's also from the 50s. East Hampton, Long Island. I was born in Cody, Wyoming, 39 years ago. In New York, I spent two years at the Art Students League with Tom Benton. The muralist. He was a strong personality to react against. This was in 1929. I don't work from drawings or color sketches. My painting is direct. I usually paint on the floor. I enjoy working on a large canvas. I feel more at home, more at ease in a big area. He was from Having Montana. the canvas on the floor, I feel nearer, more a, a part of the painting. This way I can walk around it, work from all four sides, and be in the painting. Similar to the Indian sand painters of the West. Sometimes I use a brush, but often prefer using a stick. Sometimes I pour the paint straight out of the can. I like to use a dripping fluid paint. I also use sand, broken glass, petals, string. A method of painting is the natural growth out of a need. I want to express my feelings rather than illustrate them. Technique is just a means of arriving at a statement. When I am painting, I have a general notion as to what I am about. I can 
control the flow of the pain. There is no accident, just as there is no beginning and no end. Sometimes I lose a painting. But I have no fear of changes, of destroying the image. Because a painting has a life of its own, I try to let it live. <laughs> So he's using house paint. He's a lot of times it was like latex house paint. So it was kind of this invention of acrylic paint. Or he used um, interior or exterior oil paint. It's a little bit more fluid. It's a lot less thick than traditional oil paint. So he said he likes to work large. Notice that his canvases were not stretched. Instead, he would roll it out and lay it on the ground, and there he would drip. So he has all different ways of making marks. Sometimes he'll slowly let it dribble so it kind of pulls, and other times he flicks the wrist or uses the whole arm to get different kinds of marks. So he was from Montana and he was very much influenced by the meditative practices of shaman and how they did like things like Navajo sand painting. So a lot of times when people look at his work, they think of how large they are and how they represent like the vastness of where he's from in Montana. So remember that it's based on the idea of expressionism. For every mark that you see, it's all of the about the act of him painting. You see the marks of Jackson Pollock. You see the emotion. You can tell if he's being act, you know, feeling slow or fast, um, if, if, if he's feeling angry. Abstract expressionism has a lot in common with cubism. I'd say that cubism was also a major influence in the abstract expressionist because it's about the aesthetic quality and the compositional qualities rather than, um, than a depiction of real space. So notice there's no real background in the imagery. Um, it's about the act of painting, not about um, anything else. So very, very large. Some of them have more colors than others. This is Lee Krasner. This is the wife of Jackson Pollock. She was a pretty accomplished painter. Um, before she even met him, and um, she too worked in large forms. Her brushstrokes tended to be a little bit bigger and more like calligraphy. This one's called Spring. Um, that leads us to William de Cooney. He was a immigrant from, I think, Switzerland, if I remember right, um, and he started working at the um, Oh, something Mountain School. There was a bunch of artists who immigrated from United States or to United States from Europe who started teaching at an art college, um, kind of like in Virginia. And so he was working there, but also working out of New York. And his style of abstract expressionist is the one that's in the 250. Um, so looking at de Kooning's work, how is it abstract expressionist? Right? It's the end product is the acting out of the emotion of the artist, right? It's gestural, which what I mean by that is that you see the marks of the artist, right? You see the form coming through through the marks. You see the slashing of color in the background. You see those individual brush strokes, right? And those are all intentionally placed there by the artist. Now, his style was not like dripping and splattering. He would layer paint on top of each other for years. His paintings are extremely thick, and he would often work into them while they were still wet. So he would scrape into the surface. And you can see that really well in this close-up here where he would just kind of scratch into the surfaces and kind of smear the paint. 
right? So here we have Woman Number One by William de Cooney. We're going to go ahead and watch the video on this one so that you don't have to do it later. And so when we're looking at this video, focus on how he portrays women, what the function of his artwork, and how are his different works similar. So I'll show you some more examples. We're in the Museum of Modern Art in New York looking at Willem de Kooning's Woman One from 1950-52. So this painting took a long time to paint. De Kooning worked on it over a number of years and that's really evident when we look at the surface of the painting which looks like layers and layers of different textures of paint. Some thin and drippy and some thick and matte. In fact, some of his friends, when they spoke about this painting, remembered that de Kooning actually had worked on a whole series of images of a woman on the same canvas and would work on it until the painting fell apart, and then he would basically wipe it away and start over again. So his objective was not a finished product. But instead, process, the quickness of the brush strokes, which are so visible, imply the painting was made quickly. The brushwork is almost calligraphic and muscular and tough. The paint is thick. And look at the colors that he's using. They are so garish and as if the brilliant pinks and orange and yellows up against muddy passages of flesh tones wasn't enough. He's also put a border of silver on the right side. The colors seem to be intentionally difficult those fleshy, pinky, peachy tones, but also olive green that feels really dissonant. Willem de Kooning is one of the central abstract expressionists. He was friends with Jackson Pollock. He was spending time with Mark Rothko. And yet here's a man who goes back to the human figure and the large scale seated female figure goes all the way back in the history of art to the Madonna. This is sacred art that has been brought into the 20th century and made profane and commercial. The eyes, the emphasis on her breasts. I start to see the relationship to images of pinup girls, sexualized images of women with thick lipstick teeth showing and wide grins and mascara and eyeliner. It's such an interesting moment in American history. GI is coming back from the war. The representation of the woman either on the silver screen, on a movie poster, Taking on the sexualized, eroticized images of women, she comes forward toward us. She's overwhelming in her size. She fills up the canvas. It's important to remember that Willem de Kooning was one of the few artists of the abstract expressionist generation that had been trained in a very traditional way. He could draw as well as any academically trained artist going back to the 19th century. It's about finding an art that is still meaningful in a sea of reproductive technologies where visual images are bombarding us. And it's about what the tradition of the figure means in an art world that is turned to abstraction. I find myself looking at the figure and trying to find it. Where is her right arm? Does it hang down by her side? Does it come across her lap? Where are her legs? Where are her thighs? So he's constructing that body for us, but he's also refusing to allow it to exist in any coherent way. So given a kind of abstract field, how do we populate that with the human figure? Where does she exist? Part of the tension is that the painting is essentially an abstract field. If he had pushed the painting a little bit further and the figure had dissolved, it's the abstract field of the canvas that would have asserted itself and precluded the space for the figure to exist. This is a painting right on the edge where the figure is still able to maintain itself in space, even given the hazards of the abstraction in which she exists. There is something about that space between abstraction and figuration that has to do with the fact that this is a male artist painting a female figure. She's overwhelming. De Kooning has taken the desire of the male viewer for the pinup, for the commercialized female figure in contemporary visual culture, and used that as a kind of fuel for this painting. The paint is aggressive and energetic. Her eyes are bulging. Her teeth are bared. There is aggression in this painting. This was improvisation, this was a kind of experimentation, this was a kind of discovery, it is this contemporary representation of the female figure. It is also about how that work is made. So you can see that the figures are very abstract, they're very angular, they're monster-like. It said that de Kooning was a misogynist, that he didn't like women very much. 
Um, and so he makes them into these kind of monstrous like creatures. Um, the figures are very large. They fill the entire space, just like a Jackson Pollock painting would, right? Just occupies this, the space. Um, the figures feel very fake, very blonde, very garish in color. They often feel like they have makeup, right? And the figures are often voluptuous. So very large and curvy. It's often said that what you could compare it to like the woman of Villendor from prehistoric art. So keep in mind that he's doing this after World War II. And so the painting is often compared to Ladies of Avignon by Picasso. If you remember, um, this is based on fear, right? This is based on the fear of a young Picasso about getting sexually transmitted diseases from the prostitutes that he liked to um, go see, right? Um, this is not an image of male gaze, like so many of the Venuses or the large Adelists that we saw. Instead, um, it's much more attuned to popular culture, so like pinup culture, right? This is an abstract landscape that's at the Art Institute by de Kooning. So in the 60s, we have the rising of color field. There's a lot of similarities of co in color field to the gestural artists, but instead of being full of action and motion, these are much more quiet and calm, and they're often based on Asian mysticism. And they too are these large, non-objective paintings where color um, expresses emotion of the artist. So um, Mark Rothko is probably the best example. One of the things to note about Pollock and Rothko and de Kooning, and these are men with big emotions. And so they have very high highs and very low lows. Um, eventually Pollock is, I believe, killed in an auto accident while he um, was drunk driving. Uh, Rothko commits suicide. Um, he experienced great joys, but also great sorrows. So when you look at the use of color here, would you say this is one of his joyous scenes or sorrowful scenes? Right. So his paintings are enormous. And so there are these large, large canvases. And if you remember right from the beginning of the semester when we talked about our favorite artists are, I actually said that Rothko is one of my favorite painters. And so when you step in front of one of these large paintings, they almost create their own environments. Like that orange is going to glow off of the floor. It's going to glow off of your skin. Um, there's this kind of feeling of like sunshine when you stand in front of the ones that are like warm, right? Like this example. Um, they have no hard edges. They're very soft. Um, you see a lot of glazes and transparent colors where they tend to glow. And they're normally like two rectangles superimposed on another color. Sometimes they're three. Um, he did a series of, of paintings for a restaurant in New York City. Um, this is in the Rothko Chapel in Houston. And so this is um, a series of black paintings that he did um, based on this mysticism chapel, right? And so that's gonna lead us into post-painterly abstraction and minimalism. And we only have one more artist to think about for the 250 in this area. And that is the second generation of abstract expressionist. Um, they were artists who also worked in the gestural um, approach. They often used bright colors. They had imagery that lacked a lot of detail. They used open compositions. And what that basically means is there's really no beginning, no end. Um, but their work was not as expressive. It was not as angst-driven as what we see with a lot of the abstract expressionists like Pollock or Rothko. So we have two different areas that are parts of this um, color field painting as well as hard edge painters. And so we have Helen Frankenthaler with the bay, right? So how is her work similar to the earlier painters of the gestural um, and color field styles? 
I could see them doing some sort of comparison between de Kooning and Frankenthaler. How are they similar? Right? They're extremely abstract. Um, you know, they're a distortion of reality. I would say maybe a little bit of a difference here is that Frankenthaler's, right, is much more um, abstract. It's almost on to the point of non-representation like Pollock, right? There's no recognizable imagery. Um, I should mention that people like Pollock, the abstraction is the abstraction of emotion rather than a representation of an image that you can identify, right? Also has big, large areas of color, has bright colors, lacks details, has kind of that open composition where things kind of run off the side. Um, and it's based on the, not the conventions of typical painting, so untraditional characteristics. Right? But then, of course, thinking about the differences, the major difference in her artwork is how she made it. So thinking about her process, right? So what is she doing that's different than Pollock, right? So she's pouring the color. What she would do is she would use canvas that wasn't primed. When you look at a canvas in an art store, it's normally covered in white gesso or a primer. What she would do is she would buy unprimed canvas, stretch it herself, and she would let the colors bleed on top of each other as they would um, flow. And she would tilt the canvas and let the colors run, and then they would collect and pull in other areas. So it's kind of more um, so calming because she's gently um, changing the canvas rather than the slashing marks of someone like Pollock or the scraping nature of de Kooning. Um, so she had, a, she rose to fame relatively young. She was pretty famous by the time she was 23. And so her style was based on pouring liquid acrylic or oil um, onto raw canvas. And she was um, reacting against kind of the abstract expressionist boy club. And so as you saw in the last video, mo all of those abstract expressionists were men. And they were all very like deeply troubled and kind of like macho. They go out shooting and drinking and gambling. And they were really like the, like the bell of the ball in New York City. All the galleries, all the collectors wanted their work. And so she was... Um, trying to make a name for herself in that world, right? So her imagery is kind of hard to understand, right? It's called the bay. So the name makes us feel that it is something, right? But that might not necessarily been Frankenthaler's intention, right? So what is the imagery? It's called the bay. The, a bay is what? It's a water source, right? So is that important to her, right? It kind of looks like water, right? Maybe land, and then maybe water again, right? And then, of course, does that technique help create the meaning, right? So she did a lot of interviews and did a lot of writings about her artwork. And for her... The colors on the canvas don't have to represent anything in particular. She's putting those colors together based on her mood of the day, right? And she wants them to be very ambiguous. She wants the viewer to derive their own meaning from her art, right? So the function of her art is that the viewer gets to decide what the painting means to them. Right? So that's a little different, right? And, you know, she has her own meaning, but then she allows space for us to interpret what we want from it, right? She wants us to respond to the color of it, to the simplicity of it, right? She made a whole series of paintings that referred to water and geography during the same time. And a lot of the names referred to where she called her home. She was from Provincetown, Massachusetts. Right? So remember that she really is interested in us understanding the artworks in our own terms. Right? 
So here's some other examples of her work. She wasn't the only one working in this style, but she was probably one of the most famous. Sometimes the colors are less analogous or harmonious. Sometimes they're more startling, like these complementary colors. Now this is an example of a hard edge painter. So I'm gonna zip through a few of these. A lot of the hard edge painters um, kind of want to get away from the messiness of abstract expressionism um, of gestural style. And so they were really concerned with um, compositional qualities like Cezanne. And they made very calculated paintings. They're very pure. They're very crisp. They're kind of anti-angst. They're very clean. They're very flat, right? Lots of bright colors. These are, once again, extremely large, like very, very large right? Um, based on shape, based on line. This one by Frank Stella, Shimmers. This one's at the Art Institute. You may have seen this before. There's like um, four different metallic browns on this. So very, very minimal. Um, minimalism was really a, um, a style in quite opposition of abstract expressionism. So what they were trying to do is get away from the angst of abstract expressionism, get rid of the touch, get rid of the mark, get rid of the messiness and make things that were super, super clean. And so um, Donald, um, Donald Judd is probably the best example of this. He would make, actually I shouldn't say make, he would basically design his artworks and they would be made in a factory. So they're made out of metal, they're made out of plexiglass, they're made out of color, they're made out of lights, and they really lack the human touch. They feel like a machine made them and they're based on a lot of repetition of shape and color and form. They're very, very clean. Right? Um, this is another one of the New York school sculptors. And I think it's Shapiro. Oh, no, it's David Smith. I apologize. Right? He would often play on juxtaposition of shapes and things feeling imbalanced. So he'd put like very chaotic forms on top of something very minimal. So it felt like things were going to fall over. These, once again, are large. A lot of the New York school were very, very large in nature. Right. This is Eva Hess. She was an immigrant from Germany, and hers is kind of like abstract expressionist sculpture. Um, this is called Hang Up, and she would use materials found in factories. So a lot of like um, rubber tubing, metal, um, things that weren't necessarily art materials, and she would use them to kind of hang installations, make things look like they were um, Jackson Pollock paintings in 3D, right? Or on the wall, right? And so she often has this idea of them invading the space of the viewer. Um, the last artist that we have is are Jasper Johns and um, Rauschenberger. And these two artists are basically kind of the in-between abstract expressionism in pop art. So Jack, um, Jasper Johns would take familiar symbols, very pop-like, and he'd use abstract expression style. So this is encaustic. Remember, that's that, oil, that's that waxy oil paint that the Egyptians painted in, and he'd often collage imagery. So there's paper underneath this, and you can see the thin encaustic on top, and it would often kind of represent um, hidden meaning to the image of the symbol of our country, right? He'd superimpose them on top of each other. He'd take away color. This is a protest against the Vietnam War. This is one of those optical illusions that if you stare at it long enough and then move your eye down, it will correct itself and go back to red, white, and blue. He often would do bullseyes. Those are self-portraits up there that he cast of his own face. So a lot of his works are kind of combination of painting and sculpture. He did a lot of symbols from his childhood. So he'd think about things used at school, like numbers and letters. Um, he also made a famous statement about um, if any of the artists of this time period um, made something anyone would buy it, even if it was a piece of junk. And so he made bronze copies of beer 
um, like um, cans, and they, of course, sold. All right. This is Robert Rauschenberger, and we actually watched a video on this. This is his famous bed. So this is a painting on a wall called Bed that is basically made from found materials. So that's his actual pillow, his actual blanket, and then he uses kind of abstract expressionist painting on top of it. Rauschenberg was a very influential artist, not only in like the fine art world of like painting and sculpture, but he was also a performance artist. So performance artists is basically, we'll look at a few examples later, is where they kind of make um, a play or a happening. They have like an experience where there are guests or visitors, there's an audience, and then people will kind of act out certain things, but it often feels nonsensical. It doesn't always make sense. It's not like traditional theater. So this is called Adelisk, and so it's like an obelisk, like an Egyptian obelisk, like the Washington Monument, but that also has sexual connotations to it. It's got the pillow, it's got pinup um, pin imagery on it, it has a rooster at the top. But you may have seen some of these. He uses a lot of taxidermy in his imagery. Okay, so the next area that we're going to go to is our pop Artist.